when I first saw this, it made me so happy that there were like men and women in it, but also that it happened in 1979. This kind of proves that we were there. We're bringing to you a five-part video series through NBC Asian America on queer and trans Asian Pacific Islander history. This is a project that I've wanted to do for a long time now because I always felt that as a queer Asian American, it was hard for me to access the history and the lineage that I come from and that I'm a part of. And this is my way of hopefully lifting up some of these stories and sharing them with my community. Our first stop, New York City's Chinatown. You know, I honestly don't know who they are, actually. I think that came along in the 1970s, late 70s. It looks like there, um, there's a protest happening, there's a march happening. Uh, when I looked at it, it felt like a college campus. The, the people in it looked really young. So if we're going to find out more about this journal, I think our best bet is to talk to my friend Alice Hom, a queer Asian history buff based in Los Angeles. Have you seen that journal before? I have. I have seen this cover. I've used this picture many times in slide presentations. The date of the picture was in 1979, and it happened for the first March on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. You know, I first saw this at the Lesbian History Archives in New York, in Brooklyn, and, uh, you know, just flipping through those files and seeing this made me realize there was a lot that I didn't know. And there was a lot of this history that I didn't know. Why is that? Like, how come I didn't learn this in the Asian American studies classes that I took? You know, I think the reason why sometimes it's been difficult to um, document, capture, preserve Asian American, gay and lesbian, LGBTQ stories, it's because there's this idea or notion that you have to be one or the other that if you're talking about race, race should be the salient identity. If you're talking about sexuality, sexuality has to be that salient identity. I did a slideshow on this just maybe a couple of years ago, and people who are Asian American queers don't know about it, and they're just shocked, and they're also happy to see it too. Um, so it just points out what is missing still. All right, so now we're headed back to New York this time to Brooklyn to visit the Lesbian History Archives to see if we can dig up an original copy of the Gay Insurgent Journal from 1980. Being able to hold an actual original copy of the Gay Insurgent Journal was incredible. I felt this sense of connection, of recognition, to the people pictured on the front, to the people who designed and printed the journal and mailed it to queers all across the country. For the first time, I felt like I was seeing a history that reflected all of who I am. I think with some of these names, we're definitely going to be able to find out who is in this cover photo. Is this something you recognize? Yes. Yes. That's me, with hair. <laughs> we um, put this banner together rather quickly, uh, having discovered a group of Asian um, queers in uh, the Third World Gay Conference. It was exciting being at the conference. There were 500 people. At some point, we basically announced to the conference that we, we needed time to find each other. So we asked for the opportunity to have an Asian caucus. You know, it was really electric. And it, it's like, you know, the universe was opening for us to be together and to see each other. And uh, I just remember, wow, the chills. It was pretty exciting. They were from San Francisco, they were from Toronto, they were from probably Chicago, um, Boston, Washington, D.C. I'm not sure why. <laughs> A little emotional, but it was uh, pretty amazing. I think we spent the rest of the day together, and then the next day was the march. I remember walking through this itsy-bitsy Chinatown in D.C., 
and just feeling so proud, you know, it's like, wow, you know, how cool. So they know that there are gay Asians too. You know, it's not just a white thing. You know, it's not just those other people. Uh, you know, we are here, you know. We don't live in a society where people's stories matter. People's personal stories matter. So, you know, I left out a whole part. I'm thinking here, what did I not talk about here that maybe would be important for people to know? For myself, you know, I live as a victim as being Asian, being gay, being living with AIDS, uh, not necessarily fitting the beauty standard and all those other things. But where I have power is where I'm male, where I'm cisgender, meaning that I don't have to worry about my gender and my sex matching, where I'm educated, or where I am um, um, probably more than upper class now. And so there are a lot of ways that we who have privilege and are also victimized can flip the coin and do our work in more substantive ways. If I were to tell somebody you know, just coming up right now or uh, you know, a few generations younger than myself, I would definitely say to really trust your gut. As I look back on my journals and my writings, I wish I had acted on more of my thoughts because the things that aren't right that you see you, you don't need to look to somebody else to resonate. You know, you're absolutely right, whatever your instinct is. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.